Hello and uh, welcome to this week's Politics Today and uh, we are going to be talking about our new Prime Minister Liz Truss and uh, it's early days but we're asking how is she doing as our new Prime Minister with the economic challenges that this nation faces and in this programme today I'm joined by Maureen Martin who's the President of the uh, Christian People's Alliance, uh, so welcome back Maureen and together with uh, Hugh Kitson, the uh, film and documentary maker and, and producer of the excellent film Who's Land. Uh, Maureen, it, it's great to see you uh, back on politics today. I'm sorry it's been so long. I'll, I'll make sure that doesn't happen uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, now, you've made the news recently, a uh, big interview on the Mail on Sunday and uh, defending uh, traditional Christian values. Um, can you just share with us how you kind of made the headlines around the world? Right, certainly. Thank you for inviting me again, Simon. Pleasure. Good to be here. Yeah, so um, in May of this year, I ran for mayor of my local borough. And as part of my manifesto promises, I just promised to support solid traditional family values as part of my manifesto promise. Some groups did not like what I said and complained to my employer, who then accused me of being discriminatory and put me through a disciplinary process and eventually fired me as a result of that disciplinary process. I am, of course, appealing. I am planning to take them to a employment tribunal, which is waiting for a date. And I'm being supported by the Christian Legal Centre, who are excellent. Amazing. So this is why I made the news. The Met on Sunday did a story on me. It was an excellent story back in July. And as a result, the story went pretty much global. It's been picked up in Australia, Canada, and I've been on GB News. So it's got a lot of traction. So yeah. I made the news. So. Well done, yeah. well done. Mate. And you're back on the news again on this oh, programme, which is great, Maureen. Uh, and Hugh, it's uh, great to have you on the programme. Uh, and because this programme, for it, it, well, it falls after last week, and we had the uh, historic funeral for the death of our, our monarch, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, uh, you were one of these... Um, brave and devoted followers of the Queen that uh, you queued for 13 hours to... 14 was it 14, 14, 14, 14 and, and a half. half. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, Next yeah. hour and a half can be a long time in a queue. <laughs> okay. um, but, but share with us uh, your experience of, uh, of well, seeing the, uh, our sovereign laying in state. Well, it's almost as like we've lost a family member. Um, it reminded me very much of when my own mother died. And um, she has been a wonderful example, but th the camaraderie uh, with those whom I met, and we did join a, uh, about halfway through, I met up with a group, or I was invited to join a group of people, and we're now, we've now got a WhatsApp thing going as well. But, you know, there was almost, if I can put it this way, a Christ-likeness. Um, we were all mourning her loss together. And in fact, one lady who um, I spoke to uh, she was sobbing, really, and she said, now she's gone because she's held our country together. Where's Britain going to go? And I f think a lot of people, even though they may not be uh, Christians in the same sense that the Queen was, um, in fact, I would describe the Queen as, as a disciple in life, and in death she became an evangelist. Absolutely. But I was able to point out to this lady that, you know, the God whom she believed in is in control. He's, he's still on the throne. And Charles um, at least had an upbringing, uh, a Christian upbringing, which I think is encouraging. Absolutely. And uh, Maureen, I mean, it's been uh, an extraordinary last couple of weeks. Uh, not only have we got a new prime minister in Liz Truss, who replaced uh, Boris Johnson, but within 48 hours of uh, meeting the Queen uh, and being given the role of, of Prime Minister and uh, swearing her oath to uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, uh, she died within 48 hours and uh, we have a new King in King Charles I. So we know that the media spotlight hasn't so much been on Liz Trust as we've had a, a period of 10 day mourning. But in many ways this has given her uh, maybe a little bit of a head start in order to uh, develop her, her program and a vision for the nation without that media scrutiny. Uh, I know it's early days, she's only been in office for, for a few weeks and we look, already looks like we're facing a financial crisis, but what are your thoughts on our new Prime Minister and Liz Truss? My thoughts are she's going to have to be bold and she's going to have to be very 
disciplined in what she does at the moment because we are heading for a crisis there's no doubt about it we have an energy crisis the stock markets are very you know unstable at the moment so she's going to have to put through policies that are very bold and just make um, a statement that she her plans are her plans and she's not going to be um, deterred by um, the opposition and what seems to be the right thing to do. Because what it seems to be the obvious thing to do is not always the thing to do. Her policies at the moment seem to have some people scratching their heads in terms of you know, the numbers. Because we've had um, 70 billion of COVID spending, the furlough, we've got a 60 billion bill for the um, energy and subsidies. Uh, and the numbers are racking up. So, the, the new chancellor did not really say how he's going to fund all this spending. So this trust now has to come back with the plan to fund it. The obvious thing to do is to reduce revenue spending. Absolutely, or try and generate growth, yeah, which we're exactly. trying to do, which will fill in the coffers of the public exactly. spending, and that's exactly. what she wants to do. Um, I mean, I've got to say, I, I had no expectation whatsoever on Liz Trust uh, becoming our Prime Minister. But since taking office, I've been quite impressed because if, if you have a look at some of the, uh, some of the editorials, particularly go to the, the Telegraph editorial. So they like her because they believe that uh, she is distinctly conservative, uh, believe that she believes in a small state, low tax and less of a nanny statism. Uh, in other words, what they're saying is this is the first proper conservative Prime Minister we've had in 12 years. Um, her stance on Israel has impressed me as well and uh, you know she's got a difficult challenge ahead but it seems as if she's going about this in the right way I, and it's not about being party uh, supporting one particular party over another because I know you're representing the Christian People's Alliance here so it, it's not about the party politics it's about what's doing right for the nation and in the interest of the nation and already it seems like she has a good vision for the country. I, I think she does, and I, I would like to think that one of the things that will happen under this Conservative government is that the whole woke agenda in various institutions and uh, establishments within government will be seriously challenged. Um, as you, you mentioned, for instance, the, the um, move of the British Embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which is something that she's seriously looking at. The fact that the British government have refused to recognise Jerusalem as the capital of, of Israel is a tremendous injustice. And um, I believe that that's one thing that's going to be put right. But when it comes to economic policy, I've got question marks, quite honestly. Um, I think, I think that um, cutting tax for the highest earners is possibly a mistake. It could be a PR disaster. Uh, if there's one area where I believe that tax really does need to be reduced is, is VAT because that affects everyone. And if that could be reduced rather than the high earners benefiting I believe that that would have um, given the, the economy uh, a bit more of a boost. Uh, for instance, my wife and I, we don't pay income tax because we're below the threshold being on a state pension. But we pay tax through what we buy with VAT. And I think that would have helped a lot more people. Absolutely. And uh, uh, of course, we had the mini budget uh, last Friday uh, and uh, in it came this idea of scrapping the uh, bankers bonuses, which is a uh, EU wide policy uh, on, on the surface of it. It seems unfair that why should the, the, the richest of the rich in the country uh, pay less tax? But considering her vision for the country is one to be a, a nation of innovators she wants to put education at the center but also she wants to generate growth mm -hmm. and of course with two years to go before a general election that is the key to get the economy going um, so there's more money coming in and if we are offering uh, bankers the lowest tax anywhere in europe 
it means they can make more money here. They can invest then more into the country and the infrastructure in the country, then that creates more jobs, employs more people. So the country gets, gets richer. And, and it's, a, it's a big gamble, but, um, but we know that we're in economic straits. Uh, and it's not like only our country is in a mess. Uh, other European countries in a mess, the United States is in a mess. The whole kind of world is in a mess. Um, primarily because of these global jolts that we've seen, COVID-19, the pandemic, and then followed by, of course, the, uh, the Russian war in Ukraine is, is costing the world trillions in terms of economic uh, growth and development. So they're tough times, aren't they? And um, what do you think that, that Liz Truss has to do in order to win over the British people? Because currently, Conservatives are, are only have to what twenty five percent in the polls compared to Labour, which are they're leading with uh, about forty five percent. Well, she's got two years to prove herself, and she does have to be bold. Some of these bold policies may not make sense on the surface, and in fact, prophetically, she does sort of carry the Thatcher mantle uh, of being an Iron Lady. She's going to have to be an Iron Lady mm. in this situation because she's going to have a lot of um, the distractors and um, dissenters and critics and the polls are not in her favour at the moment but she's going to have to be like a Thatcher and not be moved because her policies at the moment seem like they're not really going to work particularly the financial numbers mm -hmm. they don't really add up at the moment so she's going to have to prove herself in these two years that she can steer this ship or land this plane safely and this is why she's been bold, this is why she's come out of the gate, really, with a very firm policy that, as I said on the surface, it doesn't look like it's going to work, but it could possibly work. It's a gamble, it's a risk, and she's going to have to take gambles and risks because she doesn't have long to prove herself to the British public. Absolutely. And uh, uh, Hugh, what I'm impressed with her uh, is her kind of moral courage and uh, her speech that she made in the UN uh, General Assembly, uh, whereby she was defending freedom around the world and defending democracy. Now, the, the, the whole concept of, of the West saying that we will be the bastions of freedom, we will be the bastions of democracy and spreading democracy around the world because we know that if, if nations adopt democratic systems, there's more likely that the people will be free. And if the people are free, those nations will prosper and develop uh, and that she's serious about this. But this is something that we haven't seen from, from Western leaders uh, for, for years now, someone with the moral uh, authority to speak up on the world stage and defend the freedoms that we have in the West. We haven't heard this from Biden, we haven't heard this from Boris. So do you think that under her leadership that Britain can also be a more powerful voice on the world stage? I, I would certainly like to, to think so. Um, I, I think one of the big problems we have in world politics today is we don't have any statesmen. Um, Bibi Netanyahu was a statesman. Uh, Donald Trump, I would call a statesman, although there'd be many who would differ with me on that. I don't think you could call him much of a statesman or presidential, not very presidential in his kind of policy, well, no, in his quite. kind of character. Yeah. It's more to do with his character, but the, certainly Mike Pompeo was the Secretary Ab of State. Absolutely. And, uh, we won't go into American politics, but I would, I would like to think that she could be like a, 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 another Margaret Thatcher, because she certainly was a states person, I suppose one would say. Yeah. Uh, and um, Maureen, uh, I mean, we're here we are. We've, well, this is our third female prime minister as well, but that's also encouraging, but also uh, a bit damning on the Labour Party that they haven't produced one... Uh, one leader of their party, uh, let alone a prime minister that, uh, that is a woman. Yeah, supposedly the party of um, the minorities, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, but as I said, she does come in the, with the Thatcher mantle, and even prophetically, um, there have been some prophets who have um, seen her as such in, in, the, in, the, in the guise of the, the Thatcher uh, anointing, as you say. And as she said, um, you know, she is potentially going to be a great statesperson. I believe so, and she's mm. going to need that moral courage to do so in the current international environment we exist in today, because there aren't any great people on the platform. Netanyahu was one, he's not there anymore. 
I believe Donald Trump was a great statesman, so I won't go into that, but yeah. But, uh, but we're going to... He's a good to president, yeah. but don't get me wrong, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I think yeah. uh, in, in terms of uh, being able to unite people and yeah. even to unite his nation, uh, he wasn't, but he did the best thing in pushing back on the kind of globalist agenda. And yeah. that, that's what's interesting about Liz, Liz Truss as well, is the people that she's put around her are people that she can trust. Mm. And uh, we know that now there's such a, a globalist agenda within all the major political parties to follow this globalist agenda that just leads to electoral and economic ruin. Um, that those within her own party or, or when the previous cabinet under Boris Johnson are being marginalised is also an indicator that she is not going to take the country in that direction. And I suppose the big, big issue really is on on uh, the energy policies that's pursuing. So she has called controversy by saying she's going to start fracking again to produce yeah. energy as well. So uh, pushing back on some of this uh, green agenda. Uh, and it's OK to have green policies and a green agenda if we can afford it, but it can't come at the expense of people's living. It can't come at the expense of destroying businesses and people's finances, that they are left absolutely poverty stricken. Uh, and, uh, you know, we know that some of the science behind all this uh, climate alarmist things are, are very troubling, despite the fact the world is, seems to be getting warmer and, and going more uh, in, in is changing. Um, we have to look after the planet, but we can't worship the planet. We have to worship the Creator. I, Your thoughts? Th this, this is absolutely true. And I think this is uh, something that we need to consider. And, and certainly there is climate change. The climate has changed all the time. But how much of it is to do with carbon emissions? And how much is to do with, uh, with what is called in the insurance industry an act of God. And quite frankly, I believe not only as a nation are we under God's judgment, but as a world. And I believe really that the, the, the solution to this is for us to turn back to God, that the whole of creation is in his hands. He's the one who sustains it all. And I would, you know, I would like to think that Liz Truss would actually begin to question whether or not um, there is proper scientific basis for carbon emissions being the main cause of what is called global warming. I think uh, she needs to look at this very carefully. And there are many writers, uh, well, I'm thinking Melanie Phillips in particular, who questions it. I certainly do. Yeah. And uh, 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 maybe that's a, her strength as well. And, and if she is going to be successful as our Prime Minister, then she can't afford to be carried away by the news headlines. And unlike Boris was concerned that if he made a policy decision, it was unpopular, that he didn't want to be seen to be unpopular. So if she governs in the interests of the nation, then, then she'll do a good job of it, won't she? We hope. I mean, that's the idea. In fact, uh, I want to pick up on Hugh's point about the, the climate is issue. I hope she just looks at the numbers, the cost of the Paris Climate Accord, and decides to make a financial decision to come out of it. It's very expensive. Absolutely. It's this very is what expensive. Trump did. Exactly. And just makes a, a decision based upon just finances to come out of that. Because at the moment, we can't afford it. Yeah. Okay, we can't afford the past climate fraud. In fact, she's now reinvested in our own energy um, resources, which I've asked. We're like a Saudi Arabia of Europe. We've got our gas, we've got our oil, and we've got our nuclear program. Now mm. she's reinvested in those, meaning that she is, I think she is rethinking. Yeah. And green if we deal. move the embassy to, uh, exactly. to Jerusalem, then we might get some natural gas uh, in the process. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> which absolutely. will be a good thing. Uh, I do want to talk about uh, kind of Labour because at the moment it's the uh, Labour Party conference. Uh, Keir Starmer thinks he doesn't have to do anything, just ride out the storm and he'll become Prime Minister and be given the keys to, to 10 Downing Street. As we know, that's not easy. But we also, he's under pressure from his own party members to actually introduce a portional representation voting system. Uh, the end of our uh, majority system in Parliament. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on Labour's desires to change our voting system because it was already starting to do this by not fielding Labour candidates in areas where the Liberal Democrats are standing. Well, we've already had a referendum on, on this matter. Um, I can't remember exactly when it was, 
but it was, it was actually defeated. And, do you know, Israel has proportional representation and it's almost ungovernable. Uh, and trying to get a, a, a coalition government together is virtually uh, impossible. The only th difference with Israel, um, Israel has a king, <laughs> that uh, the king of kings and lord of lords. And actually he is the one who is governing the whole thing, but one day he'll govern it very visibly. But I, I, I think it could be a disaster if we introduce it here. Uh, uh, Maureen, I mean, this will be good for the Christian People's Alliance, uh, having a proportional representation would, system because you would uh, yeah, yeah, win yeah, more of the share of the vote uh, instead of having to require, win anything between a kind of 70,000 votes, which will then translate mm -hmm. into a seat in, in Parliament. So it's a bigger struggle for you and for smaller parties. But, but what are your thoughts on proportional representation? I think you do have to look at the bigger picture Absolutely. and how it affects the the governing of the nation as a whole, as you said, Israel is a bit of a mess in that respect. They've had how many elections in the past? Five and two years. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it keeps going on and on and on. So in the bigger picture, yes, it might be good for us as a smaller party, but our main aim is the good of the nation. It's not just our own selfish, mm. you know, ambitions. I don't have any personal ambitions to be prime minister, to be fair. But however, if it does make governing the nation more difficult, I believe we should stick with what we've got at the moment, first past the post. And, and if the nation's already been asked about this, which they have on the referendum, and they said no, well, I think if we change, it has to go to another referendum. We'd have to ask the nation again. We can't just change it, you know, without the input of the British people. If so, we'll have to ask the British people again. If they change their mind, so be it. But at the moment, I think if we keep it the way it is, at this time, we don't need any more upheavals. We're facing a financial crisis. We need to keep stable where we can keep things solid and stable and guide our way through this crisis for now. We can think about things like that later. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and Hugh, uh, we know that uh, next week it's the uh, Conservative Party conference and this is the opportunity for Liz Trust to have an opportunity to shine, to put her policies out. Um, but also she provides a, a bit of a difficult challenge for the Labour Party leader, uh, Sakir Starmer, because with Boris, he was the Conservatives' best asset and worst asset. So he, he could, his strategy was just attack Boris for his failings and his shortcomings. Uh, this should get us across the line. But with, with Liz Truss, he's got a, a, a different person and a different character he's dealing with. It'll be very interesting to see what happens uh, next week at the Conservative Party conference. Whether the, the backbenchers will be running scared and, and vote against Liz Truss, because one could almost say especially with the move of, of cutting the top rate of tax, 45%. I do think that that's a PR disaster. She could have let that one go because in the whole mix of things, it wouldn't have made that much difference. But it, if, if they run scared and, and go against her, then uh, the, the Conservative Party has been divided for many, many years. And um, I just hope that doesn't happen because otherwise um, Keir Starmer will get the keys to number 10. Uh, and Maureen, so politics is an interesting thing. It's all about confidence. And Absolutely. if you have that demonstration of confidence and you stay strong in the midst of the storms, you, she can ride out this current uh, economic crisis that she's in with the, uh, the pound being de devalued and the threat of interest rates going up and mortgage rates mm -hmm. going up. And if she can just weather that storm, um, then, then we know that the, the electorate would see her differently um, and a different leader to that of Boris Johnson, who was very charismatic, bigger than life, but lacked that kind of personal discipline. And plus he governed from the, the centre left as a mm -hmm. liberal not as a, as a Conservative. So uh, the, the big question is, she also has good people around her, like uh, Theresa uh, Coffey, who's the uh, Health Secretary and Deputy Prime Minister as well. And, and um, so she has people around her that she knows that she can trust and, and she can, can work with. Um, so my big question is going this one, how, how do we pray for her and how do we pray for the government? Because the, you know, uh, Paul in the scriptures commands us to pray for those in authority that we would live peaceful lives. 
Absolutely. In fact, the, the scripture commands us to pray first of all for those in authority. So it's the first thing we do. So we lead a quiet and peaceful life in the godless and honesty. How we pray for this government is wisdom. They need mm. God's wisdom on how to um, navigate their way through everything, but particularly mm. through this crisis. Because what seems to be the obvious thing to do is not always the right thing to do. I mean, God's wisdom, he's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows what's coming, what's been, and what is current. So his wisdom is the wisdom they need. Not the world's wisdom, not the stock market's wisdom, not America's wisdom, his wisdom. This is how we pray for the government, that God's wisdom is um, manifest in their decision making and that we pray for them on a consistent basis. I think one of the problems that we've had with our governments, if they are the way they are, because we have not been praying consistently for them. I think that's one of the main problems. Not just being involved in politics as Christians, but obeying that first commandment. First of all, pray. Amen. And this is what we have not been doing. This is why we have ungodly governments. This is why they make ungodly decisions, because we have not been engaged in the first thing we're supposed to do, which is pray. Then we get engaged in the practical sense, faith with works. This is how we pray for the government. Absolutely. Uh, uh, any thoughts on that? I, I thought that was an excellent uh, statement there by Maureen. I was just going to say, Maureen, you'd be a wonderful advisor. <laughs> um, I think one of the great things about the Christian People's Alliance is it's a spiritual, that the spiritual goals are first and foremost. Absolutely. And the economic goals, okay, they're important, but in the end, it's not just the economy that brings about the well-being of the nation. It's it's our direction under God. And if, if a government completely ignores that, which the government certainly have for the last couple of decades or so, whether it's Labour or Conservative, um, that is uh, the, the, the hole that we're in now with, with um, uh, everything that's wrong in society is a fruit of um, ungodly government. So Hugh and Maureen, thank you so much for being my guest on this week's Politics Today and I want to thank you for watching at home. Um, I think when we reflect upon the uh, leadership of Liz Truss as our new Prime Minister, she's going against the uh, globalist agenda. Uh, she wants, she's wanting to govern from a conservative ideology, which we haven't seen in 12 years. Uh, and whether we support her party or not, it's important that we pray for her as our Prime Minister. She brings in righteous legislation. So thank you for watching this week's Politics Today.